Okay. Everybody sits. Um, uh, welcome, everybody, to our first roof talk, and welcome, Alexander, the roof maintainer. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, so um, my name is Alexander Trost. I'm a, well, roof maintainer. Uh, I'm just a side note, I'm a DevOps engineer at uh, Cloudability. Um, and today I'm kind of going over uh, using Rook, or well, yeah, using Rook in Kubernetes to run Ceph in Kubernetes and kind of going into like uh, what, are the, um, the, what are the advantages of doing that. Um, and yeah, from a general side, kind of like what is Rook, a bit of uh, the architecture of Rook, uh, a bit into like the integration with Kubernetes that, well, in the end, most of the time you want to... Uh, Use the Ceph storage you, uh, you're running with Rook um, inside of your Kubernetes uh, cluster for your application. So let's say, I don't know, like a MySQL database or something. Um, and then, well, um, the advantage is kind of like, how can it help you doing that? Um, and one part which probably falls flat due to uh, technical issues on, with my laptop, um, well, it, I'll see if I can uh, get some information, some uh, video or something up that we kind of get a demo of uh, the creation of a cluster um, and also how easy it is uh, then in Kubernetes to consume the storage there and uh, while well, you're adding and removing a new uh, node to the cluster, to the Ceph cluster in the end, well, I'll, I'll have to see. Um, yeah, and in the end, just like a why rook, um, a few more points there and yeah. So. Rook um, is a cloud-native storage orchestrator. Um, cloud-native, everybody talks about it. It's, it's well, those, this cool cloud thing, you know. Um, it's specifically made for being run in a Kubernetes. The, um, yeah, which simply in the end implies that it's in a container. So it's basically a cloud-native container storage orchestrator. Um, and through this, uh, through this orchestration, uh, Rook, well, can run, for example, Ceph, but also other storage softwares, which I will come back later on, um, for you in your Kubernetes cluster. The special point which uh, yeah, Kubernetes allows through the uh, extensibility of the Kubernetes API is that you have uh, the possibility of create your own custom types and also, well, in the end, controllers which react to these custom types in Kubernetes. Um, more on that later. And in general, the goal here is that for the orchestration part, we try to uh, have the deployment automated uh, as best as possible, uh, bootstrapping of the software, uh, of the, for example, in this case, yeah, self cluster the configuration, provisioning, scaling, upgrading, migration, disaster recovery, monitoring, and resource management. Those are all points which we try to cover. Um, not all of them, the, those points are covered yet, but, well, it's open source. We are happy to see people uh, help us uh, reach the goal um, of full automation of your, uh, yeah, for example, Ceph cluster in Kubernetes. Um, as I already said a bit earlier, Ceph, uh, no, <laughs> Rook is not only Ceph. Ceph is one of the yeah, many storage providers that Rook can run for you. Um, for example, uh, MinIO, which is an object storage, maybe you've heard about it. Then there's also um, from the Next Center guys, it was uh, HFS. It's um, well, kind of in the direction of like Ceph, which provides block storage, file storage, and also object storage, but in a more like, well, in, I think they have a huge point in like geo replication by default kind of in it. Um, definitely worth to check it out. Um, and some other uh, two which I have later on the slide, which are currently on uh, in Rook. It's, well, we had first time, it's open source. It's uh, especially what is good for us, it's hosted by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. It's currently in uh, the incubating state, uh, incubator state uh, of the, um, of the CNCF uh, project level. Um, yeah. Rook framework. Uh, um, 
as Rook is not only there for just running Ceph, but also for MinIO, EdgeFS, and so on, Rook tries to get a generalization of certain types which uh, are common across, uh, across those multiple storage uh, backends. So, for example, to say it with, for example, yeah, Ceph and EdgeFS, uh, the selection of uh, the devices on nodes is the same. There, isn't, there are no two types which are different. This is one type where we basically have a list with some more details, which we go in later to, um, of which devices to use. And only already with those uh, common uh, specification specs uh, used between multiple storage providers, it's most of the time pretty easy to, well, not that I would too <laughs> recommend it too much that you, instead of like uh, distro hopping, that you uh, storage software hop all the time, but uh, in the end, something like that would be possible because you could just copy and paste the uh, device list from, well, Ceph, for example, into HFS or, well, back again. Um, yeah. With the framework part of Rook there, we not only try to have this common ground of uh, specifications, we simply also try to uh, have combined testing efforts that um, makes it easier for all those platforms to, which have their own operator in Rook. Um, to be well tested together, have policies and stuff, just share the code that is not like every uh, operator which, for example, would run something like Ceph, like HFS, and other possible software backends, um, so st software storage backends, uh, that they don't need to write that from scratch all the time. So that's one of the goals with the Rook framework, basically, there. Um, yeah. Uh, the architecture of Rook. Um, it's, uh, it's, well, it's going a bit into Kubernetes right now here as um, we're kind of a general look right now here. We have the Kubernetes API. We have our uh, client utility, which we can use to uh, talk with the Kubernetes API. And for, well, uh, adds, uh, Kubernetes uses etsd for the data store of the API objects. Um, and if we basically start from here, we have our client utility with which we tell the Kubernetes API, we tell them about these new objects. So that in the end, we end up with uh, objects like Ceph cluster, Ceph block pool, Ceph object server, Ceph files, and well, for the other operators, if you install them too, obviously those two. Um, when we have created those objects, we can access them again, just run it like uh, for those knowing about kubectl, like kubectl get Ceph cluster, and we get the object, as it is currently in the API, and uh, in more common, more uh, more current releases of Kubernetes, I think with one something, 12, 13 or so, you even get some more information about the uh, object as it is if you simply run the kubectl get to, well, retrieve the object from the Kubernetes API so that you have a quicker overview of if has it been created successfully, how many monitors am I running, and just some general information. Um, Moving on to the operators, as said, with the multiple storage backends, for example, we have the Ceph operator there then, with MinI operator and so on, for each storage backend to own operator. And the operator basically takes care of um, creating the deployments, the DM sets, and all that is needed to run the storage software. So for Ceph, it would be uh, creating deployments uh, for the monitors, um, creating monitor, uh, deployments for the OSDs, and all other components like manager, um, uh, manager OSD, MDS, RGV, um, and then also, for example, configure certain aspects uh, in the manager, like enable the dashboard, uh, and for example, enable the SSL on it, disable SSL on it, uh, stuff like that. Um, and it's making it simple by. Um, um, this is possible, again, because we have one common object, the Ceph cluster object here. With this one object with which the Rook operator knows how to handle it and has all the options we support in it, which you can just go ahead and add it for not all options right now, but for a good amount of options. You can go ahead like toggle the dashboard on the fly. If you have it on false when you created the cluster initially, you can just go edit it, put through in, so apply it against the Kubernetes API, and the Rook operator will pick up this change and do its thing and enable the dashboard. 
Now, um, moving on to this part here, um, we are, this is basically like we are on the node right now. Um, where do we have here? Uh, the daemons are obviously for, let's say, for example, Ceph, we have a monitor, no SD, or, well, one of the Ceph daemons, uh, which is uh, placed on a node. If, well, a mon is placed and uh, do you want to use the disks on a node, also for storage, you would, well, obviously also have OSD daemons running on that. But all containerized, so there's no, like, well, conflict with other stuff running on the system. It's, well, in containers, so... Yeah, well, there are certain the differences between which run time, container runtime you use from the isolation level, but they are isolated at least. So, um, um, the container part there is also the point where the upgrading for Rook is also making it easier because we just go ahead in the deployment, which for example would run in OSD there, we we'll just go ahead to the Kubernetes API and say, hey, change the image from Ceph version 12 something to version 13 something. Um, and for the other teams, basically the same, uh, same update aspect comes in place too, because Kubernetes does this management for us. Um, then there's also the Rook agent. The Rook agent is, um, in our current case, the so-called uh, we have Rook Flex Volume Provider, a plugin provider. Uh, this is, um, well, Flex Volume is kind of like the pre uh, predecessor uh, of CSI kind of in Kubernetes, where CSI is the container storage interface, which, well, kind of, uh, as the name implies, is like a common interface for storage, not only a thing for containers, but in general for storage. And flex volume is kind of like that too, but more on a limited scale, as I know, especially for Kubernetes there. Um, and we, we have it, we have it running right now still with flex volume, but it's more or less to the point because of uh, Kubernetes with having CSI support on stable, no, beta or stable with version 1.13. Um, and we're, well, currently still putting like the last three versions of Kubernetes, so we still have to uh, have the flex volume. Um, but to the flex volume here, if I have a pod which wants to use a volume on this node, it would, um, it would, no, nah, the uh, kubelet, the node component of Kubernetes would call out to the, uh, to a socket on a node, a flex volume socket, to, and then the root agent would receive this request and then, well, go ahead, get the information of the volume and do the RBD mapping and then the RBD mounting. Um, uh, one quick note, the kubelet, I think, is in most cases doing the formatting of the volume. So, um, I, yeah, yeah, I think the volume, yeah, formatting is done by the kubelet, which, um, yeah? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you are going to uh, mm -hmm. tell us more about this or not, but for instance, OSDs on, on Ceph <coughs> need access to the block devices. Is this accomplished with flex volume, or will it be accomplished with uh, the new CSI stuff? Um, I'm <laughs> trying to understand the question, sir. Uh, so, you mean the block device? The if I mount the, map the volume, no, the, so the, the OSDs. The, the OSDs itself yes. themselves, they are well, they are backed by the the disks. Yes. Right? Where they write the objects and all that mm -hmm. stuff. So I'm. The containers will need to have those block devices exposed ah, to mm -hmm. there, right? Okay, so if I understand correctly, the question is that uh, how are the OSDs uh, able or getting the access to the block devices? Oh, yeah. um, well, right now uh, it is simply done by um, uh, mounting the slash dev of the uh, host into the container. Uh, there are ways, I think, especially through um, Oh, what was it? Local persistent storage, local no storage from Kubernetes, which has been introduced. I think like 1.9, 1.8, I think. 1.9, yeah. Um, which could potentially be used for this exactly purpose. We are still kind of looking into how we can make it uh, use it like this. But we're kind of like right now, slash dev is basically working for us out. So, but we also or look already at least looking into 
restricting the slash def access to just the device and or the partitions that are on this disk and for the Ceph OSD. Um, but it, there's still a good amount of work to do to get there. But yeah. Thank you. So um, yeah. So um, if I create the Rook Ceph operator and then go ahead and create a Rook Ceph cluster object too. Um, well, I have, as already said in the previous example here, we have the agent uh, port, um, which is running in all nodes. And the operator then, as said, takes care of creating the Ceph component parts, like the OSDs, the monitors, manager, MDS, uh, RGV is also there. Um, and, well, in the end, you have a Ceph cluster with that. Uh, the, the, yeah. So, to summarize this part, we have this custom object with kind Ceph cluster, which we, the Rook operator, the Rook Ceph operator has defined. You create it, and what you currently with that would get is um, no, we a Ceph cluster running Ceph version 13.2.4 something something, um, and uh, ignoring your data, the data, the the. Uh, well, data the host path in Rook is right now where most config is stored and monitor data, but we're working on uh, trying to, well, make it really just for configuration. May still mon data, but not OSDs. Because right now the behavior would be that if you don't specify like disks and, er and anything else, you would get an OSD uh, using a directory uh, of, well, basically a uh directory OSD, which, well, if you have this, uh, from performance wise is way better. Uh, the disk one is way better. Um, yeah, but coming back here, we have like the dashboard part here where we say, yeah, we want the dashboard, so we have enabled true. We can control a bit about the monitors, like how many do we want? Uh, if we want multiple monitors on one node, this is if you have, well, only three nodes, you may or may not want this to happen. Or if you have multiple nodes, uh, you normally want to disable those more than three nodes, for example, because then you already, uh, always have a room to move a monitor from a node which failed to another uh, node and, well, create a new monitor there, basically. Um, this part with the storage here uh, is here, for example, use all nodes, use uh, all devices is kind of like controlling. There's more to control, but um, those two options are kind of um, allowing you to select where storage will be used and what storage will be used. With the use all nodes, it's kind of, well, use all nodes that uh, the Rook operator can uh, place uh, OSDs on it, which are, to put it like that, valid in Kubernetes aspect. Um, use all nodes would imply that all empty devices will be used for an OSD. And if we... Uh, I didn't upload the latest one. Um, if we go... If we skip a few slides ahead, um, we come back again to this storage configuration part where we have, again, those use all nodes and use all devices. Instead of, for example, having use all nodes true that all nodes which are applicable uh, will be used, we could also specify a list of nodes, which will uh, go have uh, information on the next slide. We can also have a simple device fiddle where we go, yeah, use all disks with uh, SD and, well, wildcard, basically. And then it, Rook will take all disks with this matching regex um, besides disks that are not empty. Um, there's also possibility to specify certain uh, configuration parameters, not only in a cluster-wide level, but also on a node and even OSD uh, part level, where in this case, for example, we have like an option which normally is only used uh, for uh, NVMe or, well, fast, faster than SSDs devices, is the how many OSDs should be created per device. Um, if we go just there one further, we are at the nodes list here, and there you can see that, for example, you have this node, you say, well, use a directory, have those resource limits in place from Kubernetes side that container, the OSD container for this, direct, uh, for, this, for this node, as it's on the node level here, will have those resource limits in place. Um, then, for example, here with a device, you have the node name, and in this case, specifically say, hey, use SDB, 
but you can also again, if it would be for example an NVMe, as it's the second or the second device here, you could then specify like config uh, and then OSD is per device like free or uh, well, ma insert the math for NVMe devices how many OSDs here, basically. <laughs> um, and it, uh, there we even have it, OSDs per device, where you can just have it per device and are on node level on cluster wide level. So um, that's uh, not all. Just have to find where I left off, yeah. Um, yeah. To shortly go into the further Kubernetes native integration part, uh, besides the so-called custom resource definition, those custom types, objects we can create. Um, we already have in Kubernetes storage classes, which allow us, the admin most of the time, to specify which provisioner and certain parameters for this provisioner um, to be called, uh, uh, yeah, the, uh, the provisioner will be called if you create a volume now, a, uh, um, no. A persistent volume claim, uh, if it matches this storage class, if it has this storage class in it, Kubernetes will take care of talking with the provisioner and saying, hey, somebody requested 20 gigs of storage, for example, if we go for one further here, this example with 20 gigabytes of storage. And here we specify the storage class name, so we especially use the one we just saw. If we create this, this will result in 20 gigabytes of storage. Um, that's kind of where Kubernetes takes, well, takes over in point of like storage management. As Kubernetes has all the persistent volume claims, which are, I hope, for everyone using them, always reflect uh, the claims an application has made. Like, hey, I need 500 gigs of storage. So it's always, uh, this application is using 500 gigs of storage. Um, and in the background, as kind of like a uh, not on Perl application level, you have the persistent volumes, which are again also having the information like which storage class uh, has been used to create this volume, how much storage is this actually, uh, what uh, access mode is used, like uh, Kubernetes has uh, three access modes, where the first is read write once, which is, well, only one can read and write to it. Uh, the second is read write many, where, well, many can read and, read and write ma at any time, at uh, the same time. Um, and there is read only many, which, well, many can read only at the same time. Um, this we have. Yeah. Um, so what can Rook kind of do to make it, well, if you have a Ceph cluster, especially because, well, you, you need to run a Ceph cluster. Um, make it better for you to, well, run a Ceph cluster in Kubernetes. Well, especially, as I said, if you have one. If you don't have one and you're like, ah, let's go, it might be a bit problematic because you need to know a bit of stuff of Kubernetes. It's, well, the simple fact that if you start one higher with a platform and then put it on, it's, you should have knowledge about a platform. Um, part what Rook does is, uh, as we heard, health checking for monitor. So if you have, let's say, five nodes, and you currently, have, uh, just for simple ex uh, example reasons, have your monitors one on the first node, a second on the second, and third on the third, and the third node would, fall, uh, would fail, it would move this monitor, fail it uh, in the CF cluster and move it over to the, let's say, node four or five, which are available for that. Um, the simple management, simply through the Kubernetes API, <laughs> in a second, um, through the Kubernetes API in point that you have those YAML manifests, kind of, so, yeah, so, say and put it like this, with infrastructure as a code, kind of. It's we yeah, are more and more, well, not only infrastructure as a code, but kind of application deployment as a code, depending on how far you see it. You have those YAML files which define how your self cluster should look, how, uh, which pools should be created. You just have a YAML file which has here a pool object with this and this name, how many replications, should it use erasure code, should it, which failure domain, which um, as a YAML object is, well, you just kubectl create it to the Kubernetes API and you have it. 
you have your uh, pool created in a few seconds, and that makes it easier on that side to well manage those things too. Uh, file system, for example, same here too. It's not like where you, oh, I want you to use file system. Let me buy five servers and install Ceph and, well, set up the MDS. With that, with Rook, well, you would need to put Kubernetes on it um, and then just create a file system object which has, inf uh, um, has uh, the uh, size numbers and everything, like for the uh, pools, again, for this file system, but also numbers like how many active monitor, uh, MDS do you want, should there be a standby MDS2, and just gives you a bit of, well, uh, playground, not to say like it, but uh, a good amount of room to have certain options and have that automatically happen. Same for RGV. You have an object, you can control it through that, have certain options to control the behavior of the pools or how they should look. Um, yeah. And the third point I would like to bring up here is that, as we saw with the storage selection, again, there you have a Ceph cluster object, you have a, either a list of nodes or a more generalized a device filter or something where you say use those uh, disks uh, in, uh, for the cluster or even directories right now. Um, which, just as a side note for the storage selection, selection, we have Travis Nielsen, which is also working on the Rook project, um, looking into enabling LVM kind of well, with the Ceph volume, with the Ceph volume part, uh, to be created well through Ceph code, well, no, Ceph code, um, and not as it was done in, since the release of Serial 9. Now it's done not, uh, not for all cases like that anymore, through Rook's own, well, OSD preparation, partitioning, formatting, and so on process. Um, yeah, well, we already went through that. Well, the why Rook part is kind of covered by what you would get as benefits uh, if you have a Kubernetes cluster for something like that. Um, but so kind of in general, it simplifies a certain tasks for uh, all the storage backend. There's, as said, still some work, like for example, replacing a node right now is still a bit of a manual process, but um, we're getting there. It's more or less that kind of a bit of a clash, like should we listen on the nodes that are in the cluster and then react if one goes missing, for example, is already just not ready, or just some points where, for whatever reason, maybe an SD issue or something, there's an empty node list, so we go like, ah, oh, nothing to run, so just scrap it all, kind of, so. Um, but, well, as I said, we're happy to just, well, see people maybe just uh, chime in on the discussions on those topics. Um, yeah. The uh, self-managing part is kind of that, well, we don't have uh, liveness props and readiness props for all Ceph components, but we I think we have it at least for the manager right now. And for the monitor, we do a kind of external half checking from the operator side to see uh, is it, well, uh, is this monitor still in form or do we need to re uh, fail it over to a new uh, node? Um, yeah. And the part with the dynamic provisioning there that I create a claim and a few seconds later, my block, device, uh, my block volume in Ceph has been created and linked with Kubernetes through the persistent volume object is, well, is a breeze to, if you want to run with applications, where you don't need to, like, well, fill in a ticket and say, I, hey, I need 20 gigs of storage, can you please provide it to me? And <laughs> someone r starts running through the uh, data center and finds, uh, tries to find a, data, uh, a disk or something for you. But it's simply dynamic there, which um, it's pretty, um, pretty good for, well, especially for developers. Um, we are also interested with, uh, kind of like with the, um, the guys from uh, Crossplane IO, uh, Jared Watts and Bassam uh, Tabara, if I got his name correctly. Um, we are looking into also trying to give, get more abstraction in like, for example, an, an, uh, a developer would say, yeah, I need a, a bucket, so he just creates a bucket object. And for example, for we also have uh, support for CockroachDB, so we would obviously, as a database, also want to look into having um, a database object which the developer would just create and then in some way, that, which is kind of still up for discussion, should it be a service broker, should we 
to play like that, do some magic like with in Kubernetes, uh, well, mounting a directory into then the pod, which contains the credentials, for example, then to this database or so. So again there, if you want to kind of jam in there, we're happy to have discussion on that. Um, the last uh, point here in this list is, uh, well, it's, it's, depending on, um, it's depending on how you see it. One problem I think is which is still existing for uh, AV, uh, AWS with the, their, uh, what was it, uh, EBS, uh, block storage from Amazon. Um, I think, what was it, the failover time was like when a node failed, it would take I think like five minutes or so to fail over to another node and well, it, I hope you're only running cloud native applications, so it shouldn't be a problem as you have more than one replica. <laughs> but um, it's still kind of a, a not too good number, as you use, even though it's cloud native and it should be okay with a failure of a pod or even multiple pods in your cluster, multiple applications. Um, it's still kind of a bummer to have like wait five minutes in the case of a failure of a pod. Um, so that's kind of where I'm kind of saying it's a less vendor login um, because well, you would run a Ceph cluster which yeah on the one hand could also create more maintenance instead of for example taking care of just the EBS volumes of Amazon but um, the failover is in this case for example faster or you just don't have to use their storage um, yeah yeah as kind of yeah, uh, said in the beginning, it's not only Ceph, there's not only a Rook Ceph operator, there's also a Rook MinIO operator, which well, is object storage, so we have a MinIO object storage object. Um, we have also CockroachDB, which, well, we, right now we only have a CockroachDB object, but ag again, we are open for people commenting and discussing with us how we can go the best path if it's more of a service broker approach or not an approach. HFS um, has been implemented by the Next Center guys. Just there again, also a big shout out to them as it's a huge work. It's not like well, it's not like a minnow where you have like two or three replicas of on a slate full set only. But there's again kind of like Ceph more complexity simply behind it, and it's amazing to see them have implemented it uh, in a, in Rook. Um, also, they're using certain parts of uh, their Rook framework. And NFS server has, has MinIO and CockroachDB and, well, HFS2 implemented thanks to co uh, the community. So, um, yeah, well, I don't have the demo right now. Uh, let me get to this page first. Um, if you want to get involved, we are on GitHub. I think some people are still on GitHub, right? Not like with uh, GitLab. <laughs> um, we have a page which we are currently re reworking. So if you're right now like, where do you find this and this? We are working on it. We know of the problem. Um, and well, we have a Slack channel, uh, a Slack, no, a whole Slack for our own. Um, um, yeah, if you want to join. We also have a conferences channel. Um, and well, if you have questions, a channel, channel, and so on. Well, Twitter, uh, we, we have, a, we still have a mailing list, I think. Um, uh, and there's community meetings every second week. Um, yeah. Um, I would just jump to the questions right now. And okay, so two questions. On one of your slides, you have there that you would allow multiple monitors per node. Is that correct? or? So the question was um, that there is an option to run multiple monitors on the same node, right? Yes. Right. Yes. I'm, I'm assuming that's for development purposes only. There are certain people which probably run Rook with just one node uh, and monitor count free. So. Development purposes only. Yes. Yes. Officially and <laughs> development purpose only. Yes. Okay. The second, the second question is yeah. about the monitors failover. Mm -hmm. you, you're saying that the 
If a monitor dies, it will be failed over to somewhere else. I'm fully aware that the monitors themselves are able to sync from an existing, at least as long as we still have one <coughs> available monitor, it will be able to sync. But um, now I'm curious, what's the storage backend for those monitors? If Just your plain disk. So, um, is that the disk mounted hmm? to, the, to the container? Um, is Kubernetes itself or Rook? Um, managing to copy that data to some extent, or is it relying on the, the monitor's synchronization mechanisms? Um. Let, me re let me repeat the question. <laughs> so the question is, um, for the mon failover, kind of how does the data get to the other node, or does the data even get copied from the node which failed to, not, well, to the other node, which is then the new monitor? No, it doesn't get uh, copied. It's a brand new monitor, okay. um, which, well, just a new directory, which, uh, well, what was it, like, just a monhouse sent here, talk to them, and as you said, then the synchronization basically kicks in for monitors, and the new monitor should be, well, up to speed in a few seconds, I hope, at so long. You will, will still always need at least one monitor, yeah. otherwise yes. everyone's Uh, yeah. What will happen with the ports that need storage? Will they go for the new monitor to be up, or they will be redistributed to other nodes mm -hmm. that already have the storage? Uh, so the question is that if a monitor fails, um, what will kind of happen to the ports then that use storage? So uh, from Ceph's side, uh, the monitor list is uh, always kind of well, to be like fluid. So if one monitor fails. Uh, well, it's still in the list of the uh, configs most of the time. So if you bring up a new monitor, and it's back in the uh, with talking with the other uh, monitors, these, this new mon map is basically where the well where the new uh, uh, the new monitors in it will be kind of distributed uh, to the OSDs or well the applications again, at, at least as far as I'm concerned. So. Okay, so yeah. you're literally <laughs> creating a new monitor and yeah. not just reusing the same ID and IP. Yes. We are creating a whole new. We're basically uh, destroying the uh, discussion for later, maybe. <laughs> Other questions? Good question. Uh, yeah. I have one. Uh, so you showed us how to deploy storage, but with software defined storage, the network layer, like mm -hmm. client, cluster to cluster, is also kind of important. How does that get defined? Um, good question. So the question is. Uh, how does the network layer, um, or well, how does the network kind of, well, what would be the network layer uh, if you, for example, then put Ceph on it and you have like, 5,000 other applications running um, in a cluster, right? Kind of? Yeah, like how do you find mm -hmm. client, public, cluster networks? Okay. Um, so, to kind of extend on what I just said uh, on the further question, it's uh, going into the direction of uh, separating the Ceph traffic, the replication traffic, and the client traffic. Um, right now, you would go and use host network mode, which, uh, well, currently Kubernetes state uh, is that you only have one interface po per pod. Um, well, if you use host network, you get a no uh, nodes network set, which has other advantages and or disadvantages, say like this. Um, but at least to go a bit further into the CNI part there for Kubernetes, there are multiple, I think two or three projects right now, which allow you to define multiple CNI plugins in your, uh, in a, in a conf config somewhere and then have uh, multiple interfaces in your pods, which I think Intel, at least, for, well, I heard it from Intel at like container days where they showed it off for like VoIP stuff and so on. And for, for them, it seemed to pre uh, work pretty good. But right now, a host network would be the way to go. So, but yeah. <coughs> That's all we have time for. Go. Okay, let's give it up.